Hey, what's going on guys? It's ETA Prime back here again. Today we're going to be taking a look at the all new Xiaomi Redmi Note 9S. Now this is using the all new Snapdragon 720G and I've been wanting to get my hands on this and see how it performs and seeing that this phone is coming in at $199, I figured this was a great chance. Recently on my channel, we took a look at the Redmi Note 8 Pro, and this is actually a great little gaming phone. It's powered by the MediaTek Helio G90T, and I was really impressed with this given that it's a MediaTek CPU. But I'm really interested to see how the 720G in the Note 9S stacks up against that other chip. So here we go. It's another budget offering from Xiaomi, actually their Redmi brand, the Note 9S. They actually offer two different variants of this, one with 4 gigs of RAM and 64 gigabytes of storage, and the other containing 6 gigs of RAM and 128 gigabytes of storage. But both of them do support a micro SD card. I went with the lower end version, which actually comes in around $198. This is globally unlocked. And given the specs we have here with the Note 9S, it's really hard to beat a price like this unless you buy something used. So obviously inside of the box, you're going to receive the handset. They offer three different colors. They have the aura blue, which I have here, a white and a black. I chose the aura blue and I think it looks absolutely amazing. You're also going to receive some documentation, a silicone case, your wall charger, and a USB type C cable. I do have to say that I love this color. I mean, it looks great and this definitely looks like a premium handset. So this is set up with quad cameras in the rear. We also have 18 watt quick charging right out of the box. Over on the right hand side, we have our volume rocker and our power button, which actually doubles as a fingerprint sensor and unlocking this with your fingerprint is super quick. I mean, a lot of companies have really improved that over the last few years and it works great on the Note 9S. Up top, we have a pinhole microphone and an IR blaster so we can set this up to control our TV or our set top box over infrared. Over on the right hand side, we have our SIM card tray slash SD card tray. Now this is a dual SIM setup with a single SD card and we can use up to a 512 gigabyte card in here. I have tested it. On the bottom, they've left us with a 3.5 millimeter audio jack. We have USB type C for charging and syncing it to your PC. And we also have our speaker down here. As specs go, this is pretty loaded down for a $200 smartphone. For the CPU, we have that new Snapdragon 720G. This is an eight nanometer CPU. Octa-core, two big cores at 2.3 gigahertz and six at 1.8. The GPU is the Arduino 618. Two variants are available, four gigs of RAM or six gigs of RAM. Both use LPDDR4X. If you buy the four, you're gonna get 64 gigabytes of storage. If you buy the six, you'll get 128. It's using UFS 2.1 storage, so it's not the fastest in the world, but it definitely holds up for a $200 smartphone. And we also have micro SD card support up to 512 gigabytes. The display is beautiful on this thing. We have a 6.67 inch IPS LCD at 1080 by 2400. It's not an AMOLED or anything like that, but for the price, it is a great screen on this device. 802.11abgn and AC dual band Wi-Fi, Bluetooth 5.0, and an IR blaster. A huge 5020 milliamp hour battery with 18 watt quick charging capability and the charger it comes with is 18 watts. Now Xiaomi is claiming that you can easily get two days of battery life out of this and if you were just using it as a phone, yes, I'd say you could. But if you're watching video or gaming, I'd say around 12 hours of battery life, which is outstanding for a $200 smartphone. I mean, it's really hard to beat something like this. We also have Android 10 with MIUI 11. Around front, we have a 16 megapixel selfie shooter, and around back, there's a quad camera array. We have one 8 megapixel ultra wide, a 48 megapixel camera, which is used in most of the Redmi and Xiaomi phones, a 5 megapixel macro lens, and a 2 megapixel depth camera. Now, you can shoot video 1080p 30, 1080p 60, or 4K 30. There's no 4K 60 here. I really wish they would have enabled it. I know the chip can handle it, but I believe they do this because they don't want to take away from their higher end phones. After all, this is $199, 4K 30, is great for something like this. So as the user experience goes, it's been pretty great. There is one issue that I'll get to in a second, but as you can see, the side mounted fingerprint scanner here works fine, opens up fast enough. You can also use your code or face unlock, but I wouldn't trust face unlock with something like this. It's just not built for it. The major issue I've been running into is a stutter in my Google News feed. Now, I haven't seen this on a lot of other, even mid-range phones, but something here with the software just isn't right. As you can see, it's very jittery, it takes a while to load, and I know the 720G isn't top of the line, but I don't think we should be dealing with these issues here. I'm going to grab my daily driver. This is a Pixel 4 XL. It does have the Snapdragon 855, which is a much more powerful CPU, but as you can see, this is how the Google News feed feels over here. Now, even though we have that 720G, I believe this could be fixed down the road with a software update. 
But as UI goes, this is the only issue that I personally run into, and when I first booted this up about two days ago, I had to go through two updates, so I am fully updated. They also add some bloat in. Most of the time, they'll have these apps pre-installed. Netflix is something that I would install anyway, but everything else here, I can delete. And they also add some games, so there is some bloat in this. It's not pure Android, it's running MIUI 11. So the first thing I wanted to get out of the way was the camera. Now this is using the stock camera app. You can install Gcam if you want. We're using the 48 megapixel sensor here and I have plenty of light. While these aren't top of the line pictures and it really can compete with flagships like the iPhone 11 Pro or the Samsung Galaxy S20, I think this definitely holds its own in the camera department for being such a cheap phone. Now remember, we have plenty of light with these pictures here, but I also wanted to test low light performance. There is a night mode here, and for me it doesn't work out as well, so we're just going to dim the lights, take the same pictures, and see how they came out. Now we're working with low light. We're using the same exact 48 megapixel camera. I've turned all the lights out. I just have a small gap in the window for a little bit of light to come in. And overall, they didn't turn out that bad. I'm actually pretty surprised at how good these look compared to the ones with the studio lights on. But then again, you definitely notice some more grain here without those lights on. Overall, I think the still shooter on this camera is actually really great when you have good light. And real quick, here's some video shot at 4K 30. Keep in mind that there is no image stabilization when you're shooting 4K 30. I also wanted to test the same thing in low light. As you'll notice, the autofocus takes a little longer, just like many cameras do with a low light. But overall, it's really not that bad. I'm actually really impressed with the camera setup on this $200 phone. Like I mentioned, if you want to check out more camera tests, I will leave a link to techtablets.com in the description. Moving over to some performance benchmarks. Now, I really wanted to compare this to the Redmi Note 8 Pro, which has the MediaTek G90T. I'm actually a big fan of it. Performance is great with that. But recently, MediaTek has been accused yet again of cheating in benchmarks, specifically with the MediaTek G90T. Now, I do believe that this is happening in certain benchmarks, and we'll take a look at that in just a second. But first up, we have Geekbench 5. The Note 9S did beat out the Note 8 Pro in single and multi-core. Now, this is just a strictly CPU test here. For single on the Note 9S, we got a 548. For multi, 1611. When we compare that to the Note 8 Pro with a single of 489 and a multi of 1563. Now, this might not seem like much, but with the way they set up scoring in Geekbench 5, it's actually a pretty significant gain over the Note 8 Pro. Moving over to a GPU test, we have 3 d Mark Slingshot Extreme on the Note 9S for OpenGL 3.1, we scored a 2,526, and for Vulkan, we scored a 2,334. We are ahead of the Note 8 Pro in OpenGL, but for Vulkan, the Note 8 Pro with that G90T did beat us out by a little bit. And finally, we have Antutu. As you can see, the Note 9S scored a 265,000, while the Note 8 Pro scored a 286,000. Taking a look at the individual scores here, the CPU on the 9S was much faster than the Note 8 Pro, but that GPU did beat us out, and I think that was in the Vulkan test here. But what's a little odd is that the Note 8 Pro beat us out in OpenGL, even though we just tested this in 3D Mark and got a better score with 3D Mark for OpenGL 3.1. Now the claim is that MediaTek is upping the GPU and the CPU clocks when it detects a benchmark running. And in the past, I know this has been done in Antutu with a couple different manufacturers, but I can't say for sure if this is happening or not. Either way, the Note 8 Pro did beat out the Note 9S in Antutu. So as for video playback or video streaming from YouTube or Netflix, it works really well here. This is YouTube. We're sitting at 1080p. As you can see, everything loads up really quickly. I am on my 5 gigahertz network at the house, but we're at 1080p, 60 FPS. Everything loads up fast. We can buffer through the video pretty quickly. Now, one thing I did notice about Netflix is we only have Widevine 1, so we're only going to be able to view HD content. We can't do 1440 or 4K, but either way, the screen still looks great with video playing at 1080p. And Netflix, Hulu, HBO, Amazon Prime Video work perfectly on this device. I'm really impressed with the gaming performance of the CPU here. The Snapdragon 720G handles pretty much anything from the Google Play Store perfectly fine. Here we have Call of Duty Mobile. We're set at medium settings with the frame rate to high. I don't think we're quite getting 60 here. 
Either way, it's still fully playable on this device. Next up, we have Real Racing 3. I also tested Asphalt 9 and Grid Auto Sport. I had to set Grid to medium settings, but we were getting a continuous 30 FPS with that one, and that's pretty hard to run. Next up, we have PUBG Mobile, and performance with this is really great. In the graphics settings, I'm set to HD and the highest frame rate, and as you can see here, it's performing great on this little device. And finally, because I know somebody's going to ask about it, here we have Fortnite, medium settings, 100% resolution scaling, 30 FPS. I have noticed a few dips here and there, but overall, you could play Fortnite on this just fine. Now, one of my favorite parts about getting these devices, and one of the main reasons I wanted to pick this up, was for emulation. I really wanted to test out that new Snapdragon 720G. I will have a full emulation test video coming up soon, so definitely keep an eye on the channel, but I wanted to test a few out here. First up, we have the Dolphin emulator running Soul Calibur 2. I'm using the OpenGL backend, and performance here is really great. Now, I do notice some stutters here and there, and that all comes down to the shader cache. It needs to be cached, so I have to play through a little bit. But in my next video, I will retest this game after playing through a couple levels and getting that shader cache ready to go. By the way, the controller I'm using here is the Sataki 7007. It's a Bluetooth controller, and the phone fits right in here. Here we have the Dreamcast version of Marvel vs. Capcom 2 running with the ReDream emulator, and I'm at 1920. I am upscaled here. Performance with Dreamcast on the 720G in this phone here is great. And finally, at least for this video, like I mentioned, I'll have a full video coming up, so keep an eye on the channel. This is the PPSSPP emulator running Tekken 6 at 3x resolution, and we're at full speed. I've had really good luck with PSP on this device also. Overall, I'm really enjoying the time that I've spent with the Note 9S so far. It's got a great looking screen, decent power with that 720G, and the cameras are pretty good for a $200 smartphone. I did run into that stuttering with the Google News feed, and hopefully that can be fixed in software. I mean, I'm pretty sure it can. I know this chip has enough power to run through that pretty easily. But in the end, I really do think this is an all-around solid smartphone, especially given the price of $199. Now, I have the 4GB model here with 64GB of internal storage. You can also opt for the 6GB model with 128GB of internal storage for around $240. And I'm going to tell you right now that in benchmarks and gaming, the 6GB model is not going to outperform the 4GB model. You're not going to get any better benchmarks out of that thing. But if you're the type of person who runs a ton of apps on their phone and never likes to close them in the background, then the 6GB model might be for you. But I opted for the cheaper version and I'm really enjoying this little device. So I will have a full emulation video coming up. We're going to test out some more GameCube. We'll go with some Dreamcast, some more PSP, PS1, N64, and so on and so on. If there's anything else you want to see running on the Redmi Note 9S or if you have any questions, let me know in the comments below. But like always, thanks for watching.